Hello, hello, welcome to this week's Baking a Mystery. Hit it. Bada bing, bada boom. Literally like the fifth bam in a row. Bada bing, bada bam, bitch. Bada boom, bada bing, bada bam. All right, welcome to this week's episode. We're talking about games. Do you like to play games with people? Do people play games with you? Do you play feel like much. you, you play would play much. a game if you didn't know it was a game? What if someone told you, I'm gonna play a game with you. The only conditions are, you're not gonna know what you win. You're not even gonna know when the game starts or what is the game, what's not the game. It's just all a mystery. I mean, imagine you're so bored with life. Maybe you're so rich and you fulfilled everything you needed to on your to-do list. And now, now you got nothing but thoughts up here. Now you got nothing but boredom. Would you accept this game? Let's talk about the movie called The Game, okay? It all it all centers around a Nicholas Van Orten, which by the way, we're also gonna be making, if you guys are watching over on Spotify or YouTube, we're also going to be making some croffles, which is essentially a Korean croissant toast waffle. Huh. It's kind it. of insane. So we've got some toppings here that I'm gonna take off the chopping board for right now. Can you pass me the croissants right oh, there? Yes. Then I'm gonna go in with this hot waffle maker. I've never So had instead this. of regular waffle, you just cook it with a croissant. Oh. Yes, but it's like, it's different, you So know? the whole thing is croissant. Yeah. You guys is are being it rude. It's innovation at its best. You're just jealous you didn't come up with it. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> very, so very cool. Like and you just... Smash it down, 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 down. Are you good? Yes. <laughs> Hot, what, when is it done? It's smoking. Whoa. Whoa! Did you see that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did they see it? Whoa, that was beautiful! Wow, that was kind of quick. Was it that fluffy? That was so good. That was so fluffy. I mean, when do I know if it's cooked? Aren't you supposed to know this? I mean... <laughs> sh <laughs> wow. So anyways, it's about Nicholas Van Orton, which by the way, what a name, right? He mm. walked into a building called Consumer Recreation Services. It sounds like the type of place that you play, you know, you pay for a tennis membership. Maybe you play golf there, or even maybe you pay for your... <gasps> Should I take it out? Um, oh, is it not hot? Is it cooked though, inside? I think you need more. You think it needs so? To, yeah. It's Rises. still rising. Holy oh cow, my god, see this? pushing the lid this up. Is Open it creepy. up. And then it just explodes, <laughs> and then we die. Okay, <laughs> let's just try this one. So I'm gonna take it out. Are you gonna eat it? Yeah, okay. You're gonna so open it? Yeah. Okay. Hot to go. Hot. Ooh. Bro, it's perfect. Whoa. I think it's ready actually. <gasps> Whoa! Okay. Yo. Try a bite. I'm gonna dip it in some graham crackers. Is that crackers. it? That's the end of the cooking? Uh-uh. Is it undercooked? Oh my god. It's undercooked, huh? I think it's perfect. Is it perfect? Tiny bit, but... Cause... Hey, can you throw it back a little more huh? and then I'll eat it? It's actually good. No, it's actually really good. I had a bite of the thick part here. Oh. Mm. Oh my god. Dip it in some Oreo cookies I got right here. What? Mmm. It's so crispy. Mm. Crispy but so soft in the inside. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. This is innovation. This really Good is. Job. It's actually Korean street food. I did nothing. <laughs> so Nicholas Van Orten walks into Consumer Recreation Services. Literally sounds like a place that you would go to pay some electricity bills. Mm -hmm. And it's a very nondescript type of building. Like it just looks regular schmegular. It doesn't look super fancy. It doesn't look super broken down. It's just confusing. Even Nicholas himself doesn't quite know why he's there. I know, that's never a good start. Smash it hard. Open it up hard. He was hesitant, sure, but Nick walked in with his shoulders head up high, his head, his chin up, and he had promised his brother Conrad that he was gonna make it. This was essentially his birthday present from Conrad, which like, what kind of birthday present is this? So Nick is greeted by this man in a gray suit, and he looks about Nick's age. Hello, um, I don't exactly know how this works. My brother sent me this card. So he hands over a consumer recreation services business card. And the man that works there, his name is Jim, looks over it and says, ah, all right, excellent, right this way. I'm Jim Feingold, by the way, vice president of engineering and data analysis. We just opened up the San Francisco branch. So please excuse the mess. We haven't had time to move in yet. So as he's walking through the building, he realizes that there's handymen installing lights. The reception area is completely empty. There's no plants, no decorations like you would expect in an upscale office like this. Our bougie Nicholas was used to all of it. He was used to the whole nine yards. He 
wanted chandeliers. He wanted 25 front desk people to escort him to a posh, just floor to ceiling windows, skylights and everything. That's the type of guy Nicholas was. His net worth is estimated to be in the 900 million range. So this guy's loaded. What the hell is he doing in recreational, <laughs> consumer, whatever? CRS for short. He walks into Jim's tiny little office and Jim starts typing away at the computer. Ah, yes, it's a gift from Conrad Van Orton. Yes, uh, that's, that's my brother. Ah, interesting. What's interesting? Well, your brother was a client at our London branch and uh, we do a sort of informal scoring, if you will, and his numbers are outstanding. Really? My, my brother Conrad? Okay, that's weird. Conrad went to rehab a couple times. He, he doesn't even have a job right now. Whatever, I digress. So Jim passes over a few pieces of paper. Now Nick, Nicholas, if I, if I may, this one is the application, then this right here is the psych test. Oh, and yes, here is another paper. That is your financial questionnaire. Obviously, you don't have to answer anything that you don't feel too comfortable answering, but uh, here you go. And he leans back onto his office chair, smiles, and Jim starts eating his Chinese takeout, which is kind of rude, considering that Nick is right there. But let the guy live. Maybe he doesn't have a lunch break. So Nick takes a quick scan over the questions and he's feeling confused. He's like, you've got to be kidding me. Th I feel guilty when I masturbate, true or false? That's a question. <sighs> Jim kind of smiles. What would you need that information for? What is that for? Well, Nicholas, it's to give us an overall sense of your capability. What? No, no, what is all of this for? What are you selling here? <laughs> And Nick is confused. I mean, what is all of this for? Like, what are you selling here at CRS? Oh, you don't know. Nicholas, it's, it's a game. A it's game? A game. Yes, specifically tailored for each participant. Think of it as um, like a vacation, except you don't go to the game, the game comes to you. Okay, well, what, what kind of vacation? Well, it's different every time. Will humor me with the specifics. Like, I want to know what kind of freaking vacation I'm going on. Like, what are you talking about? So Jim goes on to tell him, it's whatever you're lacking in your life. And Nick is so confused by all of this. First of all, why would his brother send him here? Why would his brother pay for a sort of thing? Who even, did you even know a company like this exists? Who is paying for this type of services? This sounds like literally a big prank. And why would he participate in a game if he doesn't get more specifics? Like, if you don't tell me more about this game, why would I play? Mm -hmm. So Jim is saying, first of all, Admit to yourself before you get your panties in a bunch that this sounds fascinating. Admit it. It sounds interesting. Would you be able to walk away from something like that? If you know that there is a game that's specifically tailored to you. Admit it then. And you're kind of bored in life. Let's say you have $900 million. Nothing gives you adrenaline nice. anymore. I mean, I'd be still skeptical because it's it might be like a death, you know, like it could mm -hmm. be, right? Death could be involved. So Like a squid game. Oh my god, heck no. <laughs> Like, see, if it's like a Squid Game type of game, like, I, I'm never gonna participate. Hmm. Maybe the first round. I think it's fascinating because I don't know. I feel like I'd be too intrigued to say no. Mm. No, you wouldn't say no. I'd be like, I need no. to know a little Come more. On. I would say no, for sure. But I think it would bother me for the rest of my life. Like, you'll be curious. Yeah, I think I'd be like, oh, man, what was that about? But like, what if I'm in the game even though I said no? What if it's not a consensual game? I'd be thinking these things. I'd be literally driving myself crazy. Anyways, Jim says, you have to admit, it sounds fascinating. You're intrigued. It's interesting. You've got $900 million. You've got nothing that excites you anymore. Your life is boring. Not even closing a $100 million deal tickles your pickle. You've got no This is why billionaires go to space in dildo-looking <laughs> spaceships. They want to feel something. They want to feel like their life is at risk. Come on, it sounds fun. Secondly, you don't have to decide today. Just take the silly test. What's it going to hurt you? Fill out these stupid forms. And one day, your game's gonna start. You either love it or you hate it. You can decide you don't wanna play or you can decide wow. to keep going. It's, what do you have to lose? So Nicholas couldn't help but feel intrigued by all of this. And Jim says, you know, we're like an experiential book of the month club. You drop out at any time with no further obligation, no cancellation fee, but you get to enjoy something new and novel each time. 
So mm. Jim hands Nicholas a pen and he smirks and he starts filling it out and it's freaking long. There's like hundreds and hundreds of questions. Nick has to sit there and think about each and every single one of them. And then the psych evaluation, it's not just literally a piece of paper where he's answering psychological questions. He has to be paired with a professional psychiatrist, take a look at drawings and say the first thing that comes to his mind. So whoever is doing this game, is putting a lot of money, a lot of resources into it. So what does that mean? First of all, how much does this game cost? He's got all these questions. When the psychologist shows Nick a picture of a woman on the beach in a bikini, Nick's, is it done? Maybe. Nick's first response that came to his mind was, this picture looks risky. So can you already tell that Nick is not a fun person? Like he's just kind of a boring dude. He's responsible. responsible. You're right. You're right. So he's a, a naked woman on the beach. No, is, in a bikini. Oh, in a bikini is risky. But why do yeah. they say risky? Nobody just knows. It's just too the much first temptation. For who? For for Nick. For Nick. Why, so why? Nick wants Costy. to stay away from women with that's oh. wearing bikinis because he don't want no temptations. Like no he mistake. But he's not even married. But it doesn't matter. But he that, could. A woman, that woman could be a, a, a distraction. Right. That woman could be. Um, could be me. <laughs> <laughs> could be a risky investment. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> could be trouble. <laughs> could be but trouble. But it could turn out well. <laughs> so they do a full physical exam where they check his reflexes. They actually have him walk and run on a treadmill while they monitor his freaking heart rate. I mean, the whole test is taking so long that Nick has to call his multiple secretaries. <laughs> Not one, multiple secretaries to let them know that he needs to cancel his appointments. Then there's the weirdest test of all. They put him in this pitch black room and all there is is a projector and a voice over the intercom that announces that they're going to be testing his emotional response, which you're thinking, what does that even mean? So first on the projector, there's a picture of a guy flexing his muscles and then the word masculinity pops up. Then the picture is suddenly a woman near a bed with the word submission. The, the pictures only get weirder from there. It's a picture of a man falling down on a horse, then a, ma then a woman measuring a man's bicep. The word death starts flashing on the screen and then a creepy watercolor image of a people doing it pops up and then a picture of ladybugs. Yeah, insects doing it. Then a hand aggressively juggling the jello. Just, it was a lot. There's a picture of a, the birth of a baby, a snake opening its mouth to take a bite with the word commitment. At one point, it got so freaking creepy. Nick looked around and he didn't see anyone else in the room, but he, he started screaming, uh, hello, does this thing end? No response. What is he doing with those pictures and words? He's like He's hooked up room. to machines and they're just, you know, measuring his emotional response to these pictures. Oh. It's very creepy. Then after this, a final physical that had Nick get completely butt naked. And finally, the hours long test was over. And they said, and now Nick, you just have to sign this one thing. It's for the insurance company. Besides, your brother is covering all the costs of this game as a gift. Well, depending on if you're satisfied. So does that mean if I'm not happy, he doesn't have to pay? Yes, but... Well, that's never happened before. We've never had an unsatisfied customer. <laughs> so sketchy, bro. Is it because they're all dead? dead? Possibly. And also, Nick doesn't even respond in a normal way like you would imagine. Like, what does that even mean? Are they dead? Are they alive? What? He just says, I think the word you're looking for is dissatisfied, not unsatisfied. So Jim quickly responds, all right, your tests conclude that you're a left-brained word fetish. So please sign this piece of paper. Nick ignores it and he signs the insurance papers and that's it. He's done. He's officially in the game now. I mean, what kind of person would do something like that? Let's talk about good old Nicholas. He goes by Nicholas, but we're gonna call him Nick. He's literally the type of guy, like very high snob, high class, upper class man. The type of guy that hates any nicknames. He's Nicholas or Mr. Van Orton. That's it, those are his two names. Anything else would not be tolerated. So this guy lives in this massive mansion with servants and there's a chef who preps his breakfast every single morning and he gets ready every single morning listening. This sounds like my fiance, but it's not my fiance. Every single morning listening to stock market predictions. <laughs> <laughs> Which like, why is that you? And I always have to yell at him. Can you turn that it's off? It's not prediction. I'm still sleeping. Honey, honey, it's not prediction. It's, it's more analysis. Than that. 
Give me the icing, sir. Oh, it's Whoa. rock hard. I froze it. I don't think this is going to work, if I'm going to be honest with you. What are you trying to do? No, but it's not going to work. <laughs> and that's a-okay. So I'm going to get this marshmallow fluff. It's literally like icing. We're just going to plop it on. It's just the cream. I know. I don't even know they sell these. They sell marshmallow puff. So then we're going to scatter the cookies and cream seasoning on top wow. of this. This looks delicious, no? Dude. Whoa, that's awesome. Can I try breaking it in half for us to try? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just bite. Oh, okay. Okay, ready? Oh. Whoa. Wow, do you see that layering? That looks fluff? so good. <gasps> oh, well, that looks good. Bro, shut up. <laughs> Let me try. Can I get a bite? Mm. Just give me that. Look. Insanity. Straight up insanity. Oh my god. What do mm. you think? Mm. Oh my god. Perfection. Mm -hmm. Warm. The warmth of the croissant with the marshmallow, the, you know, the sweetness and the crunchiness of the Oreo. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's perfect. It's like a perfect savory, mm -hmm. sweet combination. Heaven. What do you think? It's like, it's like something you get from like... Uh, Literally the store. The store. This wow. is good. Mm. No. Mm. I have to make a Biscoff one. It's so easy to make. Wow. Forget normal waffles. Please don't ever make normal waffles. Amazing. It looks good and it looks like you have some mustache. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. This is good, bro. Wait, so you, you came up with this? Mm -mm. <laughs> wow. Oh my god. Mm. So yes, in a sense, he seems like one of those guys that's a little bit too obsessed with the stock market. Honestly, it feels like this guy, I wouldn't be surprised if he masturbated to stock predictions. <laughs> that's literally the vibe. I just want you guys to understand what type of person Nicholas Van Orten is. So as he gets ready, he puts on a watch that reads, on your 18th birthday, your father's watch, love mother. So yes, this is another Batman trope. Both of his parents are dead, but he loves them both dearly. His dad passed away when he was very, very young, but his mom's death seems pretty recent. So he's like fresh in his grief. By the way, Nicholas is probably like 48 years old. So the guy heads into work. Now I can assume maybe he's some sort of broker potentially an investor, or just like a really loaded businessman. I don't really know what he does for a living. He walks in and he's got 55 million secretaries. His favorite one seems to be one named Maria though. And when I say favorite, he doesn't even say good morning to her. Like he's the type of guy that won't say good morning to the staff or to the workers or to the employees, none of that. So he walks in and Maria says, sir, you have quite a few invitations today. The museum gala has invited you, no. Okay. <laughs> the botanical garden is having a fun... No. Your good friend is having a wet... No. No to the wedding of your good friend? Tuxedos. Droning conversations. I don't think so. No. You've... Why do I even bother, sir? You've said no to every single invitation. Ever. See, here's the thing, Maria. You just don't know about society. You don't have the satisfaction of avoiding society. Again, very condescending, this one. So as Maria is about to leave, another secretary enters the room. I have your ex-wife on line three. Ah, uh, Elizabeth. She clearly still cared enough about Nick to call him on his birthday. If anything, it seemed like his ex-wife was worried about him. So to give you some background, some context, El Elizabeth, his ex-wife, had moved on emotionally speaking. She had remarried and she was pregnant with a child. Nicholas didn't even think before he coldly said, well, let her leave a message. Are those all the invites? Well, there there is one left, but I, I don't think it's worth your time. I, I don't even think it's worth mentioning. It's clearly some sort of prank. Who is it from? Mr. Seymour Butts. Seymour Butts? S-E-Y-M-O-U-R Butts. This is like an elementary school joke. Mr. Seymour Butts. <laughs> okay? <laughs> But the room is quiet. Maria thinks she's gonna get yelled at because what an idiotic prank, right? But Nicholas seems to get more serious. Maria, cancel my lunch, will you? And make reservations for me at the city club with Mr. Butts. Because I wanna... <laughs> I wanna see more butts! <laughs> and put the reservation under my name, not 
see more butts. <laughs> <laughs> So that night, Nicholas goes to sit alone at this super fancy restaurant. He's got his little notepads in front of him. Oh yeah. Even when he's waiting for his dinner companion, the man can't help but be super efficient. I think audiobooks changed my life. No, really. Okay, it's cool because you're just entering into this new world each time, whether it be fiction, or maybe you're listening to a health book about what nutrients your gut microbiome needs. Can you tell I'm obsessed with that recently? So whatever it is, Audible probably has it ready for your ears. If you guys are on the same journey as I am into soul searching, looking for inspiration, working towards your goals, and honestly just trying to entertain yourself with maybe some thrillers, maybe some mystery, maybe the newest celebrity memoirs, or my true crime podcast Rotten Mango, you need to be on Audible. Audible makes it so easy for me to listen anytime, anywhere. So whether I'm traveling or working out, which is something that I've been really into recently, walking, doing chores, walking my dogs, I just hop on Audible and as a member, Remember, I get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. This one title could be the latest bestseller, the new releases, the one that TikTok's going crazy for, the one that Goodreads is like, oh my god, you gotta read this. So it could be celebrity memoirs, mysteries, thrillers, motivation, business, self-help, everything. And on top of that, you get full access to their growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, podcasts, Honestly, I never run out of options there. Audible has new exclusive series that are coming out all the time. And right now, I'm listening to The Lobotomist Wife. You, you gotta listen to this. It's by Samantha Green Woodruff. And I never thought that I'd be into it because it's a historical novel. It's about Ruth. And Ruth is this very well-to-do person. She wants to help those that are suffering with mental illness. Sounds very magical and emotional. She falls in love with this charismatic doctor. He's an expert, a leader in the field of lobotomies. So at first, the couple, they genuinely believe it's a miracle treatment. Yeah, stabbing someone's brain through the nose, medical cure for everything. You feeling a little bit down? Stab in the brain. Your whole family killed in war? Let's just stab you in the brain and forget about it. You got postpartum? Stab. But Ruth starts noticing Robert, the charismatic doctor, he's getting a little dark. He's getting a little reckless. He's just stabbing everyone left and right. And the results are horrific but he keeps going and it seems like he can't be stopped. Oh, it's so good. I love that I can go from listening on my phone, hop into the car, pick up where I left off and have like the most suspenseful drive of my life. And if you guys are new to Audible, they're offering new members to try Audible for free for 30 days. Just visit audible.com slash BAM or text BAM to 500-500. That's audible.com slash BAM or text BAM to 500-500. Thank you Audible for sponsoring today's episode. So the waitress comes over. <sighs> Sir, are you ready to take your order? And it seems like Mr. Nicholas just might be getting stood up. Like, that's the vibe. He doesn't even look up from his notepad and he coldly, coldly says, no, I'm still waiting. I hate people like that. Oh my God, it irks my gears. Look at the employee who's talking to you. What's wrong with you? So he says, no, I'm still waiting. Nicholas is an ass, by the way, if it wasn't clear. He treats everyone like they're beneath him. So as the waiter is leaving, a man starts walking towards the table and we see it in the movie. As he leans into Nicholas's ear, he sneezes mm -hmm. directly onto Nicholas's face. What? Happy birthday, Nikki. It's freaking Conrad or Connie, AKA Seymour Butts. His brother. His brother. Oh. Ah. So he sits down. now. You can immediately tell that Nick's brother is the polar opposite of him. He's not wearing a fancy suit. He doesn't look like he has an entire tree trunk stuck up his ass. He just seems super casual. Conrad, what a surprise. Wow, would you look at this place, Nick? You know they gave me this free jacket when I walked in? They told me, you can't come in here like that. We're too fancy for this. Here, put this jacket on. <laughs> I'm wearing this free jacket. Okay, you know, but Nick, I've been here before. Mm -hmm. I bought fucking crystal meth from that one of the waiters <laughs> in the back. <laughs> what? Nick is ready to cut to the chase. He's like, all right, well, what brings you back into town? See more butts. <laughs> You see, Conrad has been in and out of rehab, and back when their parents were alive, the parents used to bust him out of trouble all the time. But now that they're gone, mm. Nick is just not the type to do it. He's like, oh no, you should work hard for your money. I don't, mental health break, what is that? Oh, oh, oh. Like, he's one of those people. So he did not care that his brother was in rehab. I'm sure you're here because you want something, Conrad. Mm. No, of course not. There's nothing I want, really. No, I don't, I don't need anything from you, I just, you know, I just, I found myself laying naked on the beach near Ibiza. And all of a sudden it clicked. 
Yeah, as it tends to when you're naked on the beach near Ibiza. Okay, it just clicked. I remembered, oh shit! October 12th, Nikki's birthday. Conrad, it's actually October 11th is my birthday. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So I got you something and Conrad reaches into his pocket, pulls out a birthday card and he hands it over to Nick. Wow, you shouldn't have. And Conrad says, you know, I was thinking to myself, why do you get the man? Who's got everything? $900 million. All our parents love. You've got everything, right? And uh, it was a tough one, but I think, I think I got it. I think I got it this time. So he opens up the birthday card, and inside is this very fancy invitation to consumer recreation services. Mm. Call that number, Nicholas. Why? Why would I do that? Because it'll make your life fun. You know what fun is, Nicholas? You know? You've seen other people have fun, haven't you? Is it some sort of entertainment service, escorts or something? <laughs> no, it's a profound life experience, really. What do you, what do you, what do you even say? Are you on, are you on your medication still? Why would you even say that? Of course I am. Conrad, I didn't mean it like that. It's just, I, I'm not even on anything, Nick. Like, I'm not even seeing a street. Honestly, he's offended. He's like, why would I? I literally flew all the way over here. I could have been naked on a beach in a pizza, but instead I'm here giving you the birthday gift of your freaking life and you have the audacity to ask me if I'm still on my medication? Just promise me you're gonna call this number. I think you'll like it. I think you'll love it. I did. Honestly, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So call them. Okay, uh, I'll call them for you. All right. So on Nick's drive back from dinner with his brother, he just had a head full of thoughts. I think seeing his brother really brought it out in him. And the very house that he lives in, <laughs> it looks like a drive up to a five-star nature resort rather than a house. It really just not, like he had to drive through a massive wooded park that looks like Yosemite National Park. There's these giant iron gates. You would think that he's going to the Buckingham Palace. He's got this flashback as he's driving and this scenic little, I don't know, it's like an Aston Martin commercial straight up. <laughs> he's got this little flashback to when he was younger as he's driving home and he saw what looked to be someone on the roof of the mansion. Mm. It was his dad. Oh. His dad had jumped off the roof of the mansion to his death. Nicholas had seen it. He had barely been 12 at the time and it had been haunting him for decades now. Seeing his dad just lying on the grounds of the courtyard, unmoving in this unnatural position, surrounded by these horrified staff members. And, th and then came the police. They swarmed the place. They took pictures. It was, it was traumatizing. This birthday was especially hard for him because it was his 48th birthday. His dad took his own life when he was just 48 years old. So flash forward to Nicholas being done taking this CRS test and he decides since he's done with the appointments for the day, he might as well go to tennis. He goes to the local country club and in the changing room, he overhears other businessmen. D you did CRS? Oh my God, it was so good. What? And so his interest peaks. He goes to dinner. Other people are whispering about CRS. You know, my wife told me about it and I, um, I did it. Oh, life changing. The game. Have you guys done the game? I wonder what it is. So it seems like it's very popular amongst these wealthy businessmen. So of course he's going to be intrigued because he himself is a wealthy businessman. So why the hell didn't he know about this? CRS apparently has been around for a while. He even um, started talking to one of these guys at the dinner, just a strange businessman. And they said that they have branches all over the world. They recently opened up one in California and it's like this family owned operation. So he keeps buying the guys drinks and he's like, okay, well, t tell me what the game is, you know? Tell me, tell me what it's like. One of them laughs and says, you know, <laughs> I envy you. I wish I could go back and do it for the first time all over again. The other guy's laughing and he agrees and he says cryptically, John chapter zero, verse 25. What? Um, I, I'm not religious and I haven't gone to Sunday school in a really long time. Tell us then, then what is it? I don't know, man. <laughs> so you're telling me you need Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, go find your soul, you know? I'm <laughs> just kidding. I know this by heart and not from this movie at all, for sure. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. the guy is staring at him and he says, whereas once I was blind, now I can see. So Nicholas is like, okay, <laughs> creepy, walks away. Now the next day, Nick is in a very important meeting with what I presume are very important investors when his phone rings and he excuses himself to pick it up. It might be an important call from more important investors. You never know. 
Hello? Nicholas Van Orten? It's a female voice. Who is this? It's Cynthia from CRS. How did you get this number? Look, I, I, I'm in a meeting right now, Cynthia. Can I just... I'm afraid it was rejected, sir. I'm sorry. What? You should know that this doesn't reflect negatively on you. We hoped that we haven't caused any inconvenience, and um, I'm so sorry about that. Oh my god. He got rejected from playing a fucking game. This is ridiculous, you know that? Mm -hmm. And he hangs up. But you can clearly see it on Nicholas's face that he's a bit disappointed. I mean, wouldn't you be? Wouldn't you want to know what the game would have been? And like, the minute that you get rejected, you're more curious. Like, why? Who? That's, what? That's the secret to get rich people interested, is mm. rejection. Reject them. That's the why more you reject be, it, the more they yeah, want it. Like, the, mm. they be going feral. Have you seen some of these rich dudes feral over watches? And all the watch shops, <laughs> like, Bro, they're literally in heat for watches. And all the watch stores are like, we don't have watches. Fuck off, Jeff Bezos. Now they want more. And they're like, oh my god, I'll literally S your D for a watch right now in oh the back room. There, it's weird. So now, now that he's been rejected, I mean, he's really upset. What kind of game would this have been? What would be the worst game for you? I thought about it. Mine would be a torturous game. Me on a treadmill. Picture this. Me on a treadmill. There's a chandelier hanging right in front of me, just out of reach, touching the tip of my head. Every time I run forward, I just kind of touch the lowest part of the chandelier. It scratches the little baby hairs that stand up tall on the top of my scalp. But if I, if I go too back, then I'm about to fall off the treadmill, so I have to keep going forward, and then it scratches the top of my hair, right? Now, why <laughs> would this bother me so much, right? It doesn't make sense. Well, you ask? Because the chandelier is actually an intricate, beautiful display of the most perfectly made Cheez-Its I've ever fucking seen. Every single one, perfect, no burnt edges, just crisp Cheez-It cheesiness. So close, yet so out of reach, my, my mouth can't reach, my hands are tied. Mm -hmm. I feel so anxious, sweat starts to prickle on the back of my neck. Yeah, just thinking about it. Well, that was Nick. He's thinking about it. What would have my game been like? Why would they reject my game? On his way home, he calls his brother, but it goes to voicemail. Uh, hey, Connie, um, this is Nicholas. Give me a ring when you get this. It's regarding your birthday present. Listen, things are a little crazy right now, and I don't think I can fit it into my schedule, but we'll talk about it during dinner tomorrow. I mean, why lie, right? Just tell him you've been rejected. Maybe oh. Nicholas is too embarrassed to tell his brother this Wall Street man controlling millions and millions and hundreds of millions in the stock market was rejected by a random organization he didn't even know about two seconds ago, which by the way, it probably irked him more. Remember Jim mentioned his brother Connie? He, yeah, he went through it. And had an excellent score. Mm. So as Nicholas pulls up into the courtyard of his mansion, complete with a fountain in the front, I mean, what really makes a home without a fountain? There's n no such thing as home yet. So as he turns into the courtyard, his headlights catch on to something. At first, it looks like a blanket. A red and white blanket? No, a pair of pants. One pant leg is white, the other one is red. Why would there be a pair of pants on his driveway? Oh God, is that a body on his driveway? The body is sporting black sneakers and a black jacket and a hat. Suddenly, Nick has flashbacks to his dad. His dad was lying there very close to where this new body was. So Nick rushes out of his car. Hello? He slowly approaches, crouches over, and turns the dead body over. And he's face to face with a creepy clown. Eyes wide, staring into his soul. He picks up the doll and he starts dragging it inside. Who does that? I would have left it outside, if I'm being honest with you. But he drags it inside. And he's thinking, oh my god, what the hell is this? He starts studying it, you know? Why would someone leave this here? That's so random. And for me? Like, how did they even get past my gate? But that's when he finds a piece of red fabric sticking out of the clown's mouth, like a tongue. And he pulls it out, slowly, pull, 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 pull. And at the very end of this makeshift tongue was a key with the logo C-R-S. That's what? strange. So he pockets it. He carries the clown doll into the living room and he puts it up on the armchair in a seating position and he turns on the TV. You see, Nick is on a mission. He's gonna get his little pliers. He's gonna see what else is down this, you know, deep throat of this clown. And straight back to the stock market, the TV goes. The guy on the TV says, 
Meanwhile, Republican leaders argue that this passage would be a very stimulating that the sluggish economy needs. No one has expressed an opinion as to how it will impact the pampered existence of Nicholas Van Orton. Nick froze. Okay, I must be hallucinating, that's so dumb. And the same guy is still droning on and on and on about the stock market. Okay, that's weird. So back to the doll he goes. He just needs some sort of tools, you know, to pry open the mouth. Then the TV says, A recent poll suggests a staggering 57% of American workers believe that there is a very real chance that they will be unemployed within the next five to seven years. But what does that matter to a bloated millionaire fat cat like you? What in the world? On the TV? In other financial news, stock markets rose both domestically and abroad today. And Nicholas is shocked, but he brushes it off yet again. And then another. Are you going to spend the rest of that evening prying at the clown's mouth? All right, you're done. Nicholas jumps to his feet and stares at the TV. Now the news broadcaster is staring back at him, taking notes. He's silent on national television. What the hell is this? Imagine you're watching CNN and you're watching the same reporter that you watch every single day and suddenly they're staring at you. They just said your name. What the heck? <laughs> it feels like the newscaster is staring at him and Nicholas is just talking to his TV and he says, I, I, don't, I don't understand. It's frustrating for me if you don't pay attention. What the hell is this? This is your game, Nicholas, and welcome to it. I'm here to let you in on a few grand rules. You received your first key and others will follow. You will never know where you'll find them or how you will need to use them, so keep your eyes open. How can you see me? There's a tiny camera looking at you right now. Impossible. So Nick starts looking around. The newscaster tells him, you're cold. You're getting warmer. Warmer? It was in the clown. And then a phone number flashes on the TV screen. Nicholas, write this number down. It's a 24-hour consumer recreation services hotline for emergencies only. But don't call asking what the object of the game is. Figuring that out is the object of the game. Good luck and congratulations on choosing CRS. The screen glitches and the narrator literally goes back to talking about stocks as if nothing just happened. So the next day at the airport parking lot, a man approaches Nicholas and asks him for spare change. But Nick is too jittery to even care. He's just looking around, feeling so paranoid. He's staring at every passing face like everyone could be part of the game now. He doesn't even know. One guy at a bar looks at him with his martini glass and kind of signals at him. Me? You want to talk to me? And he points down at Nick's shirt. Oh, fuck. A stain. So Nick rushes to the bathroom to get the stain out of his shirt, and while he's there, he sees a hand reach from the stall underneath. Toilet paper. Buddy, can you help me out? I need some toilet paper. I ran out in my stall. <laughs> what? Nicholas glances at the hand, and he just leaves it. He ignores the poor toilet paperless skid mark man in the bathroom. Then he rushes to his gate, and then gets on a private jet, because he's better than all of us. Which, by the way, uh, my fiance and I were listening to the world's most unrelatable podcast, and it was a bunch of billionaires comparing, comparing planes and plane chefs. One guy was really sad because his plane was too small to have like a kitchen for a chef. Oh, yeah. And it's you know, I really like thought that he should start a GoFundMe. <laughs> Let me know if you guys are interested in donating. I will donate with you guys. <laughs> so anyways, Nicholas changes into a brand new shirt. He flies to Seattle for a business meeting with a guy named Anson. Now Anson, a little backstory, used to work with Nicholas's father before he passed. He's a bit of an older guy. He's actually the founder and CEO of a massive children's book publishing house. And now Nick is a massive investor in that said publishing house. But Nick is not pleased. He's not doing well. Nick is invested in this publishing house and they're not pulling the numbers. So he sits Anson down and he says, Anson, you know that our earnings per share was just 150 last quarter. That means we're up six cents. The expectations were 10 cents. Yes, but the projections were far too optimistic to begin with, and I told you that. Yeah, sure, but you promised to meet them. So what are you saying? I mean, I can't believe it. This is the first time that you've stepped foot in this office in all the years that we've been working together, and you, you want me to step down? Over, over what, pennies? Six cents? Ten cents? Yes, but those pennies are costing millions. You, you son of a, if your father could see you now, your father was a friend, a friend, goddammit. I watched you grow up, Nicholas. Dang. So, because you went fishing with my father, I should sit on my hands while you're throwing away my money? 
I'm firing you, Anton, and there's nothing else you can do about it. But Nicholas, there's no Bear Grant publishing without Anson Bear. I'm Anson Bear. I'm sorry, but you failed. Nick started to stand up and he says, in my briefcase, I have some severance packages for you. That is more than equitable, more than fair. And if you don't sign them today, then every minute it's going to be decreasing. But when Nick goes to open his briefcase, it's not opening. He pulls out his keys to unlock it. And that's when he sees the CRS key. Fuck. Is this another clue in the game? What is this? What does this have anything to do with the game? Wait, so, his own suitcase wouldn't open? His own briefcase. Briefcase. Now oh. Nick is horrified. He's kind of embarrassed. Like, imagine you're talking all this shit. You better sign this today. Anyway, it won't open. So <laughs> I'll like docu sign it to you or something. Like, that's embarrassing, right? So he's trying to cover up his little embarrassment. Well, it's your lucky day, Anson. My lawyers will be in touch with you. And with that, he flew back to San Francisco in his private jet. He tried to use the CRS key to open the briefcase, but it wouldn't work. So it's kind of strange. Maybe his brother would know something. He's meeting him for dinner that night, right? But of course, Connie's late. When is he not late? Nicholas is irked, annoyed. He gets up to use the restroom and he runs into a waitress holding drinks. His tie is now soaked in whiskey. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, sir. She starts dabbing his tie. Please don't do that. I'm so sorry, I wasn't looking. Oh god, I was just having a really bad day. I'm so sorry. And Nick raises his voice. How about a bad month? You did almost the exact same thing to me when I was here last week. Maybe you should stop being so clumsy. The head waiter saw the commotion and he rushes over. And the waitress, you know, she's disheveled. She, she's like, it, it was an accident. I said that I was sorry. She then called Nick an asshole. So her boss promptly told her to clean out her locker and head it, head for the door. Get out of here, you're fired. I mean, what the heck? So he offers to comp the whole meal. I'm so sorry, Nicholas, Mr. Van Orten, this is my apologies. I don't know what happened to her. Maybe she wasn't listening in the training. Uh, I'm so sorry. The meal is on us today. Oh, we love you, sir. We, you are a valued customer here. It, it's fine. Nicholas sits down, obviously annoyed, and seconds later, he's even more annoyed because another waiter approaches him and says, your check, sir? I didn't even order anything. Are you serious? And he opens it up. And all inside of it was a slip of paper with the words, don't let her get away. So the waiter, Christine, the one that spilled the drink on him, I mean, it's got to be referring to her, right? So he rushes through the back kitchen into the freaking locker room. Miss, pardon me, miss, miss. He's screaming at her as he's chasing her down out the back door. And she's like, oh, great, it's you. Listen, I, I don't know how this works, miss, but do you, do you have something for me? What? Creep! No, I don't have something for you. What, because I spilled a drink on you? You want something from me? Disgusting! Nick takes out the bill and he says, No, 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 please, just listen. I got this note for you or from you. I don't, I don't know. Jesus, what are you babbling about, you psycho? And she starts walking away. Ma'am, I just need to know what's going on. Yeah, you want to know what's going on? I'm going on my second job this month and now it looks like I'm going on an unemployment. That's what's going on. Okay, ma'am, maybe I should try to explain. Christine is briskly walking away because this guy just got him fired and he was an asshole and he's struggling to keep up with her. And she's like, don't explain anything, sir. Just fuck off. Listen, I'm trying to apologize. I'm apologizing. And in that moment, a man walking down the street near them collapses onto the ground, his face down on the ground and his briefcase slipped out of his hand. Christine starts flipping out. Oh my God, sir, are you okay? Are you okay? Do you know what to do? Fork, can you, I, I don't even know if he's breathing. Can you call the police or something? And Nick is just standing there watching. What if this is some kind of CRS ploy? Don't just stand there, go get help. How do we know he's real? How do we, what's wrong with you? He's pissed his pants. Is that real enough for you? Oh, good God, he's turning blue. So Nick pulls out his phone, but he spots a police car nearby and he flags him down. Now, an ambulance arrives, and as the medical responders carry him into the ambulance, they explain to Nick, Sir, you have to fill out some forms. He's like, what? I don't even know this, man. Why would I? It's standard procedure. If you don't comply, we'll have to detain you. You guys both need to ride in the ambulance so that we can fill out a statement, a form, a witness thing. Okay, fine. So they get into the car, and um, by the way, this guy is literally passed out, and he's like on a ventilator, and Nick is like... I mean, he's breathing, isn't he? What's with all the commotion? Do they really think the <laughs> sirens are necessary? God, it's so loud in here. And Christine is just sitting there like. <whistles> so at the hospital parking lot, the EMTs rush the man into the emergency room and Christine and Nick are slowly trailing behind. So one by one, as they're walking through the parking lot, every single light in the parking lot goes off. 
What? One by one. Oh, and Nick is trying to explain, this is what I was trying to explain, this is the game. This company, they plan these elaborate pranks. Something like, honestly, I don't really understand it myself. So you mean the guy that just pissed himself and turned blue was, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, you should be. I thought the guy was gonna die. I gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Ugh, <laughs> disgusting. So Christine starts to walk off. I I'll see you around, dude. But Nicholas follows her, and they start walking through the parking lot in silence. And suddenly, on the speaker, a voice comes on through the parking lot. Where did you all go, you mother frat boys? It's so weird. So Christine looks at Nick, and is like, I don't know if this is the game, but... I feel like you better hide or something. They rush into the hospital and they get into an elevator, but the door won't close. They wait for a few seconds, nothing. Nick reaches into his pants, whips out his CRS key, and tries to put it in the elevator keyhole. Obviously, Christine is confused. And he's trying to explain. Listen, my brother got it for me. It's a gift certificate to this company. I got this key. And it, it, it came out of the mouth of a clown. <laughs> okay. Never mind, I don't, I don't think I need to know all of this. And suddenly, the elevator starts shaking violently, and the lights are blinking on and off, and the emergency lights turn on, and Nick reaches for his phone. No freaking signal. Christine looks up at the emergency shaft, and it seems like that's their best option. So Nick tells her, I'll go up first and give you a boost. Listen, I'm a very important person, and I've got a jam-packed schedule where I only do important people things. Huh? And when it comes to emails and proofreading and checking my grammar, my tone, Anna Delvey said it best, I do not have time for this. But now I don't have to worry so much about all of that because I have a digital writing assistant. Grammarly is more than a spelling and grammar checker. It's an all-in-one writing tool that allows you to clearly and effectively communicate your ideas. Grammarly is actually free to download and it's honestly so easy to integrate into your daily life. Whether it's Gmail, a Word document, Google Docs, even text messages, Grammarly is there for me. They've got a ton of free features that will help you make sure that you're saying what you mean by checking your tone. This makes sure that your message is not misinterpreted, which is like my biggest fear in life. Grammarly has premium features that will even go as far as helping you with full sentence rewrites when something isn't clear. Grammarly also suggests more decisive phrases and word choices, which helps me be a lot more clear and assertive in emails, which is something that I've always struggled with. And by far, one of the most necessary features for me is their clarity suggestions tool. Okay, it helps me simplify my sentences, gets to the point faster, cuts out all the unnecessary stuff. I use Grammarly with anything and everything, and you should too. So get through those emails and your work quicker by keeping it concise, confident, and effective with Grammarly. Go to grammarly.com slash bam to sign up for a free account, and whenever you're ready to upgrade to Grammarly Premium, get 20% off for being my listener. That's 20% off at g-r-a-m-m-a-r-l-y dot com slash bam. Thank you, Grammarly, for sponsoring today's episode. So the two of them make it up the elevator shaft. Now they're literally on top of this elevator, which is so dangerous, sounds like my biggest nightmare in the world. And they find a ladder on the side of the wall. So they think that they can get to the next floor up, go through the open shaft doors, and they should be fine. Nick does forget his suitcase inside, his briefcase inside the elevator, but he decides, you know what? It's too late now. It's not worth going to grab it now. In the dark, dangerous elevator shaft, they climb up, pry open the doors, and they make it out safely. It doesn't look at all like a hospital. In fact, it's pretty clear that it's the same building that Nick came to apply for the game CRS headquarters. What? So as they start walking around, they set off a motion detector, which sets into motion a blaring alarm noise, and Christine just starts booking it. Hey, 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 no need to run, Christine. Security's gonna show up and we can just explain what happened. I'm part of the game, remember? They're playing a mm -hmm. game on me but he can't help himself. He just starts running after her. Maybe he doesn't want to be left alone. Maybe it's the fact that she had told him she has no underwear on, so don't look at me when you help me up the elevator shaft. Or up your shaft. What? <laughs> so, they got really excited. Suddenly they're both invested in this movie. Okay, they're like, what? Tell me more. So on their way out, they see a security car already on the lookout. Shit. They were spotted. Let's just run through the back alleyway, it's fine. The security officer, being one step ahead of them, jumps out of his car and releases a German Shepherd. And the dog starts sprinting after the two. And they dead 
us start parkouring it through the alleyway. Just mm. unnecessarily jumping off the walls, unnecessarily jumping over fences and the box. Like it was one box. You could have run around it. You could have hopped, but it was like a full on jump. Nick loses a $1,000 shoe. The two end up falling into a dumpster, which cannot be good for Christine, who's not wearing any underwear, right? But at least they lost the guard. At least they lost the guard dog. They're in the clear now. So he says, hey, come to my office building. It's nearby. We can get clean in there. And Christine is impressed. I mean, it was massive. His office was massive too. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, his, his office was massive. And she says, well, do you have a shower I can use? And maybe some fresh clothes. And she takes off her shirt and she's just standing there in a red lace bra in front of him. <laughs> yeah, sure, let me get you a towel. And he tries to look away awkwardly and he says, listen, I'm, I'm so sorry again. I, you know, I know, I know the owner of the city club and I'd be happy to give him a call if you'd like your jog back. No, don't, it was a shitty job anyway. Also, I have a confession to make. Someone gave me $400 to spill drinks on you today. I don't know, they said it was some sort of practical joke. What, what the fork? Oh. So Nicholas decides he just needs sleep that night. Like, that, this all sounds so crazy. So he wakes up the next morning by his phone ringing. It's 11 a.m. Like, he's literally never slept in this late. He was ex expecting to sleep until, like, I don't know, 6 a.m., not 11 a.m. So he crawls out of bed holding his lower back because parkour in the back alleyways with the women going commando is not how a 58-year-old <laughs> should be spending his time. He needs chiropractor. He rushes into the office and Maria is already on his ass. Sir, Anson Byer is in town at the Ritz-Carlton and he's requesting dinner tonight. Oh, and Hotel Nico called. They said that you left your American Express black card at the front desk. Nicholas reached into his wallet and sure enough, his card was gone, but th that's strange. He doesn't ever remember paying for anything. O okay, well, uh, um, okay. He grabs his phone and dials Hotel Nico. Hello, this is Nicholas Van Oren. I'm told that you guys have my American Express card there. I'm sorry, is this an ad, by the way, for American Express? <laughs> it's a lot in that one second, okay? Ah, yes, Mr. Van Orten. Everything's in order. The concierge has arranged for the wine and the flowers in the room. Has he? Yes, and a young woman called to say she's on route, but she's running a bit late. <laughs> a what? young woman? Did she leave her name? I don't know, sir. Right, of course. Well, thank you. I will be there. Nicholas, curious as ever, he rushes to the hotel <laughs> to see what this young woman is about. You know what I mean? Rushing to his <laughs> hotel room. <laughs> Flowers, are you kidding? So the receptionist immediately recognizes him. Ah, Mr. Van Orten. I'm sorry, have we met before? I believe so. Nick is confused. He's literally never seen this guy in his entire life before. If you could just sign here and I can give you your card back. Okay. Oh, and uh, could I get my room key, please? Oh. Did you lose yours? I gave you one last night. Nick reaches into his pocket and sure enough, the room key. Oh my God. Of course. What? How did he not see that coming? This game is getting creepier and creepier by the second. An employee escorts him to his room, but right when he enters, he just has this eerie feeling, okay? So first of all, it's not a hotel room. It's a fucking hotel mansion. First of all, mm. the landing, the opening is there's a piano room and this is not, <laughs> yeah. But on the piano, there's a cigarette tray, an empty wine glass, an empty water glass. Someone's been in here. When he walks into the next room, yeah, it's more like a full blown townhouse, okay? So he, into the next room, there's a living room and it's complete and utter destruction, mess, chaos. There's wine glasses everywhere. There's a red stiletto there, a whole bunch of pictures showing erotic and nude photos of a faceless woman. He opens up the briefcase that was on the coffee table. Even more photos. One of them catches his eye, though. One of the faceless women was wearing a red lacy bra, just like Christine. There were also pictures of a man in the pictures with her, but he was faceless too. So, I mean, it's hard for us to tell if it's him. There's also porn on the TV just casually playing with the volume. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, and a glass dildo sitting on the table. <laughs> All right. But the eeriest detail of all is that there's a check signed with Nick's exact signature on the table. Weird. Like, Just was he the there? He signed a check? Like, none of that makes sense. Oh. So he grabs a mirror, the dildo, and a razor blade. <laughs> what a trio of objects. <laughs> he brings it to the bathroom to get a closer look. And listen, I don't know why he didn't turn off the porn first. We'll never know. It's not even pertinent to the story, but it's just something that I've been thinking about. Like, who doesn't love a good villain soundtrack? I'm sure the hotel was charging him a pretty penny for each episode. 
Is that what you call it? <laughs> Episode. So as he goes to set down the mirror in the bathroom sink, the mirror shatters and he cuts himself on the glass shards. He moves to the toilet and he grabs the folds of toilet paper to soak up his blood and he throws it down the drain. But when he flushes, the freaking toilet is clogged. Mm. Not only that, the water levels are rising and the toilet is overflowing. The bathroom is slowly getting puddled. He runs back to the room, scrambles to gather up all the porn pictures and the check, and he leaves the suite. Which is kind of funny, no? Like, the guy did not run when he saw naked pics or porn playing on the background, but when he saw, <laughs> ew, toilet bowl water, he ran out of there so quick. Disgusting. But he collected the photos. Yeah, he was like, I gotta use these for later, when I'm listening to my stock market predictions and it gets too good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he rushes back to his car, and as he's driving off, he notices in his rear view mirror a freaking car is tailing him. A black car. The last thing he needs, right? So he needs to get this guy off his back. He runs a red light, swerves into an alleyway, which by the way, I feel like this movie spent a good deal of their budget on alleyways. And they're like, how do we use up more alleyway scenes? So they're going through the alleyways. The car follows him. The driver's pissed. Fuck, where did he go? Nick jumps out of his you know, car and jumps up to his window. Where, why are you following me? <laughs> I'm not following you. I'm just, I'm driving through. Nick's eyes fall on the passenger side. And there's a very obvious file of Nick, and literally his picture on there. Is this about the Anson business? Is this, did Anson hire you? Look, buddy, just back off, okay? Nick reaches into the cart and pulls the gun off the guy. Oh yeah, that's real cute. I suppose the game uses real bullets, huh? Nick fires a shot into the guy's front tire. Except it's not a blank. Like, this guy thought it was part of the game, so he shot the gun to be like, hee hee, ha ha, BB gun. But it was... <laughs> He just fired a real bullet. There's a hole in this oh guy's God. tire. I mean, the driver starts panicking. He gets out with his hands in the air. Okay, okay. Calm down. I'm a private investigator. Somebody hired me to keep tabs on you. Who hired you? I, I can't tell you. Nick is screaming and banging his hand on the car. Who hired you? The private investigator is already making a run for it. And it's, it's clear. Nick is unhinged. But at least he knows now. The game has something to do with Anson. He just knew it. So he picks up the phone and he says, Maria, get a hold of my lawyer, Sam. Have him meet me at the Ritz-Carlton. So he confronts the buyers who are having lunch at the Ritz-Carlton. This is Anson, the guy he just fired. And he says, do you really think that I'm going to be okay with this? You really think that you can manipulate me into keeping your job? Just because you run a publishing house for children's books, people are going to care about my reputation? He throws the Polaroids on the ground. So it seems like, yes, this, this is probably him and Christine in the pictures. And he says, just because you publish children's books doesn't mean people care about me. You can have pictures of me wearing nipple rings and butt f***ing Captain Kangaroo, and the only thing people care about is the stock prices. And the fact that you brought my brother into this mess, are you freaking kidding me? Oh, okay, so he thinks... Yes. Mm. This guy he fired mm -hmm. had his little brother yes. tricked him into a game. Now they're hunting him yes. or whatever. So the guy tells him, <laughs> Nick... I talked to your attorney this morning. We met this morning, so Nick's attorney was there. I signed the termination contract. I accepted the settlement, Nick. I decided to retire. My wife was on board, and we're going to travel now. We're going to live our lives. Nick looks uncomfortable, and Sam, the attorney, looks even more uncomfortable. Nick tries to apologize half and he rushes out of there. He done goofed. He goes back to his office, and his attorney is really concerned about him, you know? Typically, this is kind of a bit of unhinged behavior. It's mental illness, ain't it? And uh, he's, he's just trying to explain, Sam, there's this company called Consumer Recreation Services, and you know what, wait a minute, they gave me a waiver. Could you review it? He hands over a small black package with a smiley face on there. Sam frowns, that's not a good sign, okay. And uh, he opens it and he sees an empty piece of paper with Nick's signature at the bottom. Nick, you're joking, right? Like, what the hell is this? This is what I'm dealing with. I'm being toyed with a bunch of depraved children. Nick, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. See you at the tennis club this weekend. So as it turns out, and I mean, it's not really implied in the moment in the movie, but it's signed with invisible ink. So no, his name is signed with regular pen, but the rest of the contract was invisible ink. So over time, it disappears. So now that Nick is looking at it, I mean, he doesn't even know what the hell he's signed for. He, his lawyer is like, okay, you're losing your mind. He has no one that he can even prove it to that he signed this, you know, disclaimer. He signed this contract, nothing. So he goes back home thinking he just needs a good night's rest. And when he gets to his house, his house is completely dark. He's thinking, where are the staff? Where are the lights? Where's... He tries to turn on the lights, but sparks fly out of the switch. And he, he pulls his hand up and out. 
He almost got electrocuted. So he starts inching through the hallway and he starts feeling terrified. He takes out the gun that he stole from the PI and he starts walking through the mansion. In the living room, he triggers an alarm. It starts blaring sirens and these emergency blue lights come on and the entire living room has been graffitied with the words, welcome home. I mean, the entire place, not just the living room, is covered with graffiti. It feels like a weird trip. The ceilings say things like, fucky, cool, cool, cool. Then there's background music, which by the way, just by listening to it, I'm like, am I freaking high right now? <laughs> like he starts walking through his house covered in graffiti, random words. They say like, don't cry, pretty boy, fuck boy. Then the clown doll is sitting on the armchair with papers in his mouth. So he snatches them and on the top it says, Like my father before me, I choose eternal sleep. And then a picture of his father's suicide, taken from the police report. Does that mean somebody's trying to fake a suicide note for him? Or maybe the game is trying to drive him crazy to do it. So it's implied it could be both ways. Okay. Either the game is going to kill him and they're going to make it look like a suicide, or they're going to drive him mad. To the point of suicide. That's kind of insane. So he goes to his servant's quarters, which is a detached house. And she's been, you know, kind of the only one that he's liked in his life. She's been there since he was a kid. He never really shows it to her, but they have this weird bond, right? And he's like, Isla, are you okay? Are you okay? Did you see what happened to the house? Stay inside. Lock your door. I'm going to call the police. So he runs back to the main mansion while on the phone with 911. And he's trying to say, yes, this is 2210 Broadway. Like, it's the biggest house on the street. And in that moment, someone pops up from the other side of the glass door. Nick screams. It's his brother. Shh. Nick, shh. The 911 operator is like, hello, sir, are you still there? Connie whispers at him. Meet me at your car. So Nick hangs up the phone, gets in, and they drive off. Now, Connie looks horrendous, like his face is greasy, his shirt is disheveled. What the hell is going on? Connie's like, shh. He keeps glancing at the rearview mirror to make sure that they're not being followed. Conrad, where are we going? J- just wait. If I can't even trust room service, I'm not going to trust this car. I'm not going to trust this car at all. What? CRS. What are you saying? Oh, I'm so f- they just fuck you and fuck you and they fuck you and just when you think it's all over, that's when the real fucking starts. Calm down, t- take, a t- take a deep breath. They won't stop, Nick. I paid the bill, I gave them their fucking money and they won't leave me alone. What are they, what are they doing to you? Everything! It's like I'm a goddamn punching bag. In that moment, they hear a big boom, like a gunshot, and Conrad loses control of the car. The front tire is busted. So now he's screaming hysterically, they fucking did this! Conrad, calm down. It's just a flat tire. Get a grip on yourself, will you? Do you even know how to change a flat tire? Here, let me go back there. Will you open up the glove compartment and open up the trunk too? Connie opens it and a flood of keys start coming out like a full-on flood of keys, all branded, hundreds of them, with the CRS logo. He looks up in horror and he walks over to Nick, holding them. You're one of them, aren't you? You're doing this. You're part of it. What? Whose are these then? I don't freaking know. Someone must put them in my car. You're behind the whole thing, aren't you? What the hell are you talking about? You bought CRS to me. But these keys, they were in your fucking car. Connie throws the keys at him and makes a run for it. So Nick is like running after his little brother. Like, Conrad, listen to yourself. Listen to what you're saying. Why would I do any of this? Because you resent me. It kills you that I'm living my life. Shh, keep it down. There's people around. I mean, this is a residential street. What? You're so afraid that someone's going to see what a manipulative fucking control freak you are? Sorry, Nick, that I don't live up to your expectations and I'm not you and I'll never be you and I don't want to be you. And Conrad sprints off. Nick decides he probably just needs his time. So, I mean, Nick felt torn, to be honest. He did feel like Conrad's constant partying, sex, drugs, not working. I mean, he's wasting his life away. But at the same time, Nick never really had a choice. His dad chose him. His dad gave him no options. He was trained and expected to take over and grow up and be just like his dad one day. So as he's walking back to the car, a phone booth starts ringing. That's weird. Who the hell calls a phone booth? He picks it up. The fight that he just had with his own brother was recorded and is being played right back to him through the phone. What the hell? So he hangs up and he calls a cab back home. He can't deal with this right now. So he gets into the back exhausted, staring out the window, thinking about Connie. And he says, oh, wait, sir, um, you were supposed to make a right here. You missed a turn. The driver doesn't respond. He keeps driving. 
So he looks up at the driver's license, you know, because they have it on the dashboard. Mm. And uh, the company name, California Regal Sedans, CRS. California, oh my God. Stop, stop the car, let me out now, stop the car. The car stops, but when Nick reaches for the door, the handle is gone. (gasps) Suddenly, the taxi lunges forward, causing Nick to hit the back of the front seat. The taxi driver starts jerking the car around, left, right, left, right. He starts laughing this evil, maniacal laugh, like howling almost. And then without even a warning, the driver opens up his own door and jumps out of the taxi. He hits the ground, tumbles a few times, and Nick is shocked. But he realizes what just happened. The taxi is going full speed into a metal fence, and through that metal fence is a body of water. He can't open the car door. He's taken off his seatbelt. He's, did you guys know, roll down your windows if you're heading into a body of water? Mm -hmm. Let the water in. Because if you don't roll down your windows, you can't open the door. Too much water pressure. Mm -hmm. So you're going to suffocate. And the water will slowly drip in. But if your windows are open, you just have to wait until the car is sunk. And then you can swim out, hopefully. And you can't even um, open the window when you're in the water. No. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. It's like midair. You gotta be. Oh. Like wow. enough to get your body out, I heard. Wow. So you gotta do it fast. Yeah, and you can't even like get out while the car is sinking because the pressure of the mm. car sinking, you won't mm. get up. You have to wait till it completely yeah. sinks. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. That's what I learned online. I don't even, wow. Reddit be telling you some stuff. Or you could have one of those window breakers in your car. Mm-hmm. That's a smart one. So the car was going into a body of water and he wasn't going to be able to undo his seatbelt fast enough. So he lets the car go crashing into the water. It starts filling up with water. So thankfully the door was open, all of that stuff. He starts fighting the urge to full on panic and he starts closing his eyes. It's just the game. It's just the game. Don't panic. And he remembers he had a door handle that was given to him in the smiley package with the contract that was now disappeared. He pulls it out of his jacket, inserts it to the door, and boom. He somehow manages to open it, which is crazy because he can't really open it in a body of water, but he does, right? Water comes- It's escape room. Yeah. (laughs) Water comes flooding in and he swims to the surface. Now he's thinking he's had enough of this stupid game. So the next day he goes to the police and they meet him at the CRS building. Except nobody's there. It wasn't rented. The entire place hasn't been rented for a long time. Oh, and of course, no company called Consumer Recreation Services exists. They couldn't even find the taxi that he almost allegedly drowned him in that body of water. But of course, the police are going to be working on this case because Nicholas is rich. But they have no idea why anyone would want to do this to him. Meanwhile, Nick gets his assistant to track down Christine's address. Now, he doesn't know much, but he knows that Christine probably has something to do with it. So he shows up at her place and it's this huge, beautiful two-story house that looks like it's in need of some desperate remodeling. But I mean, the bare bones are there. He knocks on the door. Christine's roommate opens up and she lets him in. Christine is there in her PJs and, you know, he's, he pulls out the Polaroid. Is this, is this picture of you? Where did you get that? A hotel room. Are you telling me that this is not you? What makes you think it's me? The red bra. Are you all right? You're not all right, are you, Nick? Is it that dumb contest thing or the game or whatever? You know what, I'm sorry, I should just go, Christine. No, it's okay, we can talk. Let me just change out of these PJs. She leaves the room and while she's gone, he takes it upon himself to look around the decorations on her fireplace. There was a Virgin Mary statue, a lamp that still had its price tag on, that's weird. Then he walks over to the kitchen because he had burnt himself on the lamp and he tries to run his fingers under cold water, but no water. He opens up the fridge. Nothing. What? He walks over to the bookcase and the books are all fake, just filled with cardboard. There's a picture on the desk where Nick opens it. It's a cutout from a newspaper. The whole place is staged, fake. Nobody actually lives there. So Christine comes back and she says, you want something to drink? Is this you in the picture? Oh yeah, that was me when I was young, my first communion. Show it to me. Take the picture out of the frame and show me. Okay. She walks up to him, takes the picture, and whispers, they're watching. Shh, smoke detector. What should we do, Nick? Should we go for a drive or something? No, I'm tired of this. I'm goddamn tired of this. Let's go for a drink, Nick. What do you think you people are? Come on out, come on, I'm not scared of you. Please, Nick, let's go. Let's go right now, please. Nick gets up and smashes the smoke detector with a camera. And he really done forked up because immediately when he does that, a bunch of cars pull up with CRS written. Men in uniforms start piling out, running towards the house. I mean, they've got guns. 
what do we do? Christine is like, get away from the window. Christine grabs Nick, hand, leads him into the back exit. They just make it out as the shooter swarm the upstairs floor. They hop into a car and they start driving off. The CRS van tries to follow them, but Nick drives into a very narrow alleyway and the van won't fit. Christine's pissed. I can't believe they didn't take the time to get the fucking house right. Who are they? I don't know. Nobody does. I'm just an employee. What does my brother have anything to do with this? He was in on it from the beginning. I mean, it's not his fault. I guess, I guess he thought it was his only way out. They did the same thing to him that they're doing to you. What do you mean? Have you checked your accounts? That night in your office, I got the number to your private line and your modem, and that gave CRS remote access to your computer and you gave them everything else. What? During the test, you gave your voice samples, test handwriting, psych information. They used it all to figure out the passwords. They only had to keep you distracted with the game, while they broke into your financial network. They transferred all of your holdings into dummy accounts. <laughs> 900 million dollars? 900. Like that. Nick is already on the phone with his most important bank, the Swiss bank, and he's notified that his entire account has been completely emptied. He calls every single bank, all with the same result. It's no use, Nick. They already got it all. Why else do you think they're willing to shoot at us? Because they're finished with you. They don't need you. They got what they wanted. Nick drives her to the only place that he thinks they'll be safe, an old cabin in the woods. He used to spend time as a family there with his, uh, with his parents when they were alive, and the two of them are sitting by the fireplace drinking coffee when she says, My name's not Christine, by the way. I mean, it's, it's not my real name. Who fucking cares? It's just money, Nick. We should be glad that we're alive. How many times have you done this? What? The scams, the cons, how many? A lot. You know, it's not just me. It's pension plans, payrolls, this is $900 million we're talking about. Then Nick gets a call from his attorney. Hey, it's Sam, I just got your message. I just wanted to let you know that your funds are intact. Not a single penny has been unaccounted for. Nick, what's, I don't know what's going on, but give me your exact location and stay there until I get there. I'm worried about you. Mm. Wait, what? I think the attorney's in this. Uh. So he's looking at Christine, eyes wide. Oh yeah, the attorney's in on it, so he just hangs up on him. How did they get to my lawyer? I wouldn't worry too much about it. What? What do you mean, don't worry too much about it? It's out of our hands. And Nick starts to get woozy. He looks over at the coffee table and he realizes that Christine had spiked his coffee. He tries walking yeah. away, but yeah. he collapses onto the ground. Christine explains, while you were on the phone checking all your accounts, we intercepted those calls and we pretended to be the banks. We got all your account numbers from you. Literally from you. While attempting to check if we took everything, you literally gave us everything we needed. What? And with that sweet statement, Nick blacks out and he wakes up in a wooden crate. He's in a very stuffy room with a low ceiling. Looks like it's a barn, but it's not, it's like a tomb. He crawls out and he realizes he's in a cemetery with crosses everywhere, a small white chapel, even his own clothes are white. Someone had changed his clothes. He runs out of the cemetery and into the city and he realizes he's in trouble. Not only is he not in San Francisco anymore, but he's in freaking Mexico. He does not speak any Spanish. He has no money. So he asks the locals to the American embassy and he ends up bribing the American embassy officials with his father's gold watch to get around to not having a passport. They smuggle him across the border, but he still has to hitchhike to San Francisco and he's asking patrons just at diners for help. Uh, can I please just get a dollar or two for a bus ticket to San Francisco, please? They all just sit in silence and they, they try not to look at him or make eye contact. And now Nick knows what it feels like to be on the other side. Dang. Finally, a truck driver says, I'm headed that way. I can give you a ride. So he drops him off, but Nick still has to walk to his mansion. But the gates are sealed. The whole property is sealed off with a note. Public auction foreclosure notice. He ignores wow. it, climbs over the gate, he takes a cold shower, and he finds some cash, as well as his hidden gun. He's always had this gun. With no one else to turn to, he calls his ex-wife Elizabeth, and they meet for coffee. Now, Elizabeth always cared about him. She hands him her car keys and says, you can have it if you need it. He even apologizes to her. You know, I've been doing a lot of thinking the past couple days, and I wanted to tell you that I understand why you left me. And I wanted to apologize for shutting you out and not being there for you. And I hope that one day you can forgive me. There's nothing to forgive. It's fine. But at the coffee shop, during this conversation, something catches Nick's eye on TV. 
It was an ad for migraine medication. And you're thinking, what does that matter? But the actor, the guy in the commercial, was Jim Fangold from CRS. This guy's not a part of CRS. He's literally a paid actor. So Nick tracks him down by finding out who his, this esteemed actor is, right, for migraine medication, stalks him at the family zoo where he's hanging out with his kids, and his name is actually Lionel. And he starts panicking when he says, sees Nick. And he says, listen, listen, it was just a job, nothing personal. I need to talk to who's in charge of this. Nobody knows that. Besides, this is very dangerous. Nick gets up in Lionel's face and says, listen, I don't think you understand, but I'm extremely dangerous right now. So Lionel smuggles Nick into the CRS headquarters and there are hundreds of workers there. Some of them faces he knows. The private investigator is there. The guy who is tailing Nick, even, you know, Christine's roommate from earlier, she's there. Oh, and guess what? So is Christine. The minute she sees him, what are you doing here? Back from the dead, he pulls a gun up to her face. You're gonna come with me. So the guards notice this commotion and they start shooting at Nick, giving Christine time to make a run for it. Lionel, who is standing close to Nick, ends up being shot with a few bullets in his chest. Christine runs Jeez. out of the side door into a hallway and Nick is chasing after her. The two of them end up on the roof together. He locks the door and Christine's saying, what are you doing? You tell me who did this to me and why. It wasn't personal. It could have been any household with a few couple hundred million dollars in the bank. Christine is eerily calm for someone who has a gun pointed at her face. That is, till she gets a good look at the gun. Where did you get that gun? That's not an automatic. What the fuck are you talking about? The guard had an automatic. Where did you get that gun? It's not the guard's gun. This is my gun. But we searched your entire house. Where did... You didn't have a gun. Well, I guess you missed this, huh? She starts panicking. Nick, it's... It's, it's all fake. It's all part of the game. Don't pull this with me. No, listen, please put the gun down. Seriously, it's, it's all a game. No, you're trying to kill me. No, no, nobody's trying to kill you. Please put the gun down. It's all staged. There's, there's, there's a safety net, the taxi, there was a, the diver, the, my house. They shot us with blanks. That's not true. Yes, it is. That's what we're hired for. They're waiting on the other side with champagne right now. Sparks are flying. They're cutting through the metal lock of the roof door. And the door bursts open and Nick immediately fires a shot. The bullet bursts through the champagne glass that his little brother is holding. <gasps> and blood starts to pull in his white tux and he drops to the ground. Lionel, who he thought was dead, was very much alive and he starts screaming, Oh my God, somebody call an ambulance! Nick is just frozen in horror and Lionel can feel Conrad's pulse. He's dead. What? Nick can't stop crying. He drops the gun and he approaches the edge of the rooftop. And just like his father, he jumps. And as he's jumping, he remembers the last birthday party he had with his dad before his death. And he crashes into the skylight. So right underneath the building of like the roof that he jumped was this massive dining hall. And it's got skylights. And he came through the skylights and he falls on a large black mattress. And in the center is a large X. All the ballroom guests jump up in horror. Elizabeth is there. So is Isla. And they scream, we've got him. He's on the bag. He came right on target. They're all clapping. Medical personnel rush to Nick. They brush off the glass covering his face and get him up on his feet. And as Nick gets up, he sees Conrad walking towards him with a blood-stained white tux. What? Happy birthday, Nicky. What? What is going on? Conrad pulls out a shirt that says, I was drugged and left for dead in Mexico and all I got for it was this stupid shirt. Your birthday present. Nick shakes his head and runs to him and hugs him. What, what is all of this? Your birthday present. Listen, Nick, I had to do something. You were becoming such an asshole. And just like that, Nick realizes it was a game. All of this was an engineered game to get rich people to realize and not be such an like this guy literally thought money was everything. He fucking hated his family. He treated his ex-wife like shit. He treated random employees like shit until he felt like that he needed them for something. Remember, he didn't care about Christine until he felt like he needed her for something. He was the epitome of just someone you would absolutely hate because he's despicable. So this showed him literally life is short. You could lose all your money at any second. You better humble yourself, dude. Look at all these people who actually care about you. 
So Nick feels good. Wow. He starts approaching actors, and suddenly, I mean, he does change. He's like, "You did such a good job," and Lionel is laughing. Listen, we're just glad that you jumped because I would have had to push you through the roof if you didn't. He promises to call Elizabeth. He even apologizes to people, and he thanks Conrad for everything. He said, "I really needed this." And do you need me to split the bill? Oh yeah. Oh God, yes. Okay. Wait, but he had his gun. His own gun. So apparently they replaced it or something.、Mm. Ah. So everything literally was part of the game. Jeez. Yeah, they're that good. A genius game. Okay. Wow. And what happened to the waitress? Oh, Christina, you saw her leaving to hail a cab. So Nick rushes out and he stops the cab and he says, "Can I take you to dinner one day?"、Ooh. Well, I'm flying out to Australia for another work thing, but we can have coffee at the airport tomorrow. And he smiles and she says. By the way, my name is Claire, and she closes the door, and now he cares, and that is the story of the game. It's beautiful, right? But like, I don't know. This is too much. It's too much, but it also gets you thinking. You know, I do think that everyone needs to have like a moment of humbling, no matter where you are in life. But、mm-hmm. truly, how hard it is? How hard is it? <laughs> Wow, how hard is it to be a billionaire? How hard is it for someone at that level? Because most people, they're like, "Fuck, I need to make rent next month."、Mm-hmm. But、yeah. for billionaires, you know, how hard is it for them to have these types of moments in life where they're like, "I need to get my life together. My priorities are all messed up." Fascinating, no? But how did they pull it off? It's confusing. Yeah, I feel like it could go wrong in so many ways. Yeah, like they could all get killed. Yeah, I and thought all of this was real, bro. Me too. Then then. You got played by、yeah. the game. Also, this is a game. Welcome to the You're game. You're in the game. You don't know what our objectives are, Dan Dan, but you might find out one day. Dan Dan Dan. Dan Dan Dan. But I hope you guys enjoyed this week's Baking a Mystery. Let me know in the comments,、wow. and I will see you guys next week. This guy's still mind blown, so we're gonna have to take it easy for the rest of the night. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.